good job and what a timely word, a word that the world needs to hear, is to know that God loves them, gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, for this entire world, whether you be, as examples given, a teenage mother, or the old man who feels lost, forgotten, that black sheep, that one who's been ostracized, maybe cast aside for your family. A lot of times, we do that to ourselves. I've gone out and lived a riotous life, and this, that, and the other, but just as the Bible teaches us in Luke 15 with that prodigal, God's, uh, God's uh, arms are always open, amen, mm -hmm. to receive us again. So you can be that black sheep and, and come back because God sent Jesus Christ to die for us. This morning we have a little bit of reading. Let's go to John chapter 14. We'll look at two verses there. We want to pull a message from John 2, 14, <coughs> 2 and 3. Just had one of these scriptures uh, as a scripture of reference for one of our selections on this morning. <clears throat> but John 14, 2 and 3 simply says, In my Father's house, Christ is speaking. For Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions, or dwelling places, or abodes. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. In my Father's house, Jesus begins here in verse number 2. He begins by uh, with a word of comfort there in the beginning of chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So he's telling them, don't worry about this. And he says, in my Father's house. So the, the, the area where I can escape to, to get away from the trouble, and to, for my heart not to be troubled, is indeed in the what? In the Father's house. So this morning, for just a few minutes, we're going to speak to you from the subject of, in my Father's house. In my Father's house. On last week, you all recall that... Uh, my in-laws, my wife's parents, uh, visited with us last week for the graduation of our son, Ryan, from high school. They spent about a week with us. And in the time that they were here in Georgia with us, we kind of, you know, turned over certain parts of our home to them, you know, to make them feel welcome. And to make them feel like welcome guests in our home. And in our home, we have, I don't know, I guess this was four bedrooms and an in-law suite and a kid, all these different little places. But there were certain areas of our home, for example, you know, my wife and I put them up in our bedroom. We let them have the larger bed with the bathroom, but we gave that over to them, even though it was still our home. We turned that over to them. We, we did something for them because all that was needed was in the house. But we, we gave them a portion of it to use for themselves. My father likes to watch baseball. So a couple of days he tried to catch a game down in the den, so we let him have it. You know, we did certain things to make them feel welcome in this home. We had all these different little places that was set up, right, for them to do things. I think my mother-in-law even needed to wash a load to a load. Well, the washroom became theirs, right? If they needed to go in there and do something, it wasn't, that's my washing, not a church. You can't know. In this home, all of these little places were set up so they could do what they needed to do while they were our guests, right, in this particular home. Now, in my father's house, and I'm speaking of now my earthly father, before he passed, as a child growing up, when I would go to visit with my father, uh, his home was uh, the home of a single man. When my father and mother uh, divorced when I was a young child, we would go and visit with my father in the summertime, and he would take us to the boys' club, and this, that, and the other. But my brother and I realized there were some things in our father's house we didn't do. We didn't go very far in our father's house. I mean, the far as we went is from the living room to the bathroom if we had to use it. And then we sat there in the living room waiting for my dad to get ready because he was an entrepreneur. He had gone to barbershop, so he would get himself ready, get dressed, and get ready to make the beginning of his day. And at the beginning of his day, as he got ready to go, he would take us with him, and we'd do some of his running around. But in his house, there were certain things we didn't do, right? Because that was my father's house. It wasn't like the house where my mother was raising us, where I had a room, and I had my little computer and my toys. and this, I could, I could you know, kind of run around and have a little room in the house, free room in the house. Couldn't do that in my father's house, because that was his. When we look in Scripture now, at the house of God the Father, and we talk about the church, you know, the places where we gather, being the house of God, that's wonderful, that's nice, right? And there are certain things that we shouldn't conduct or do in God's house, right? And we look at that. When we come to the house of God the Father, there are some things we ought to look for. There ought to be some characteristics in the house of God. And I go back now 
to the scripture reading we read earlier this morning. I'm going to turn back, and you remember we read Genesis chapter 31. And in Genesis chapter 31, we read a little bit about Moses, right? In Genesis 31 on this morning, we read verses 1 through 16. But in Genesis chapter 31, In Genesis 31, excuse me, I'm sorry, wrong reference. Genesis chapter 31, we talk about uh, the two sisters there, Rachel and Leah, I'm sorry, and their father, Laban. And in Genesis 31 and 14, Rachel and Leah answer, they're answering uh, their husband by saying, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us and hath quite devoured also our money. <laughs> they look here and realize that as a father and as the children of a father, there is an inheritance. There is something in the father's home that they should be welcome to have. But they look here at this particular father and says, what? He's wasted. He spit it up. You know, he treats us like we're what? Strangers or outsiders. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the way you and I are treated and that we're not going to be treated in God's house. Because remember now, Jesus is speaking to his disciples right after Peter's Denial is foretold. In John chapter 13, Jesus begins, John chapter 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. He said, calm down, fellas. It's going to be all right. Why? For in my Father's house, there are many mansions. There are many dwelling places. And when you look at that, that small little word, he says, in, he begins this statement in John chapter 14 and verse 2 with the word in. That word in in the Greek denotes being within, it denotes, it, denotes, uh, it denotes abiding and dwelling. When he says that in my father, hey, it talks about once you get there, we will be there forever. It's not like we're passing through. You know, God's house isn't like a Motel 6 or a Holiday Inn, y'all. We don't just check in and, okay, when it's time to go, we leave. When we get there and dwell and begin to, to live in the Father's house, we will be there forever. And all that is within there is for us. Christ even goes on to say that, what, that I'm going away that God already has the house, right? He says, in my father's house. But he goes on to say in verse number three there that I go to prepare a place for you. He says, and if I go and prepare this place, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So God already had the house set up but inside the house, much like I shared with you the example of my in-law. Before they came to our home, we got, some, we got certain things ready for them to make our home welcome and appealing to them, you know, for the week they were going to be with us. We wanted them not to feel as though they were a burden. We want them to feel comfortable and relaxed. You know, they had taken some time out of their schedule, taken time off work to come and be here with us. So we wanted them to feel at home. So we did some things to make them feel. We, we purchased some things, some things that we knew they liked, right? That may not necessarily be part of our diet or part of our daily routine, but we got some things in place for them. There again, what? Make them feel good. Jesus is doing the same thing. God already had the house. Our house was already set up, but my wife and I and our family got things ready for our guests to come in. Christ says, I'm going away to prepare a place. The house is already built. Right? God has done that. He is that divine architect. Much just like he built the church, he's got this wonderful, beautiful place for us in glory. It says, in my father's house are many mansions. They use the term mansion, but dwelling places or abodes. There are many, many places for us. And Christ says, I'm getting this one ready. Yours is going to be custom fitted for you and for what God would have us do, right, in glory. But in our Father's house, we see there's an inheritance there. It's unfortunate on this side, though, sometimes some of us feel like Rachel and Leah do. We look at the Father's house that we have on this side, and sometimes our parents don't leave us much of anything. And I'm not talking about financial things. Parents don't even instill spiritual things into their children. You know, to give that, that spiritual inheritance that children so desperately need in a world such as today. These women, think about that. Think about being the son or daughter of a mother or father and saying that your mom and dad make you feel like a stranger or an alien. That's what Rachel and Leah said, right? That's what they said here in Genesis chapter 31, verse 4, 15. He says, are we not counted of him strangers? Wait a minute. Strangers, you mean you done grew up in this man's house and being women, you know, dad and the brother would have taken care of them as well, right? Being women, you know, being that weaker vessel and looking at the times they lived in back then, there were certain things women just didn't do. The men did a whole lot more stuff, right? Women had a role, men had a role. But now they say they feel like strangers in their father's house. Isn't that unfortunate? Do we do that to people today? 
Do we have folks come to meet with us here and, you know, our representation of God's house on this side? Do we make folks feel like strangers or aliens sometimes? You know, those that ought to be of the family of God, do we sometimes maybe, I don't know what it is that caused us to do this, but we see the Laban's case, it was greedy, right? He wanted this, he wanted this, I'm going to keep working him again. He wanted this, he wanted it. He changed, the man said, he changed my wages, what? Ten times. Do we get folks in the church? Because this is God's house, right? The divine architect we talk about in the New Testament doctrine of the church, right? We talk about that divine architect. Do we get folks into God's house and then we start heaping things on and changing? Well, brother, that's what I told you first, but see, now you need to. But see, you got to add this to And we keep adding and changing to where they feel like, man, I don't feel like I'm a part of this family. I, feel, I still feel like I'm an outsider, yet I proclaim the same Jesus you did. Right? I believe, just like the song just said, that God so loved the word that he gave. I believe in that, but you cheat, treat me like I'm still an outsider. And I'm supposed to be your brother or sister in Christ. These two young ladies said, we have been counted as strangers. Jesus says, in my Father's house. So being in the Father's house, there's something else we can expect. In our New Testament scripture passage, we read from the book of Acts, remember? And we talked about Moses in his young life. And it says here in Acts chapter 7, uh, as we were looking at our scripture here, we read here, it talks about the promise drawing nigh. This promise we read in Acts 7, 1 through 5. God had made a promise to Abraham. And as the promise got closer, it says the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Another king arose that didn't know Joseph. He didn't realize anything that had gone on before. And he dealt, excuse me, he dealt treacherously with the children of Israel. And it says during this time, right, Moses was born. And he was exceeding fair, verse 20 says. He was well-pleasing to God and nourished up in his father's house for three months. In the father's house, there is nourishment. What we need to grow should be in our father's house. As a father, I pray that I provide that for my children. What they need, I'm not just talking about cereal and milk and a nice warm meal and sandwiches and potato chips. I'm talking about what they need to grow spiritually. The spiritual nourishment is what should be done in the Father's house. It should be there for those children. The same is true with us in the house of God. There should be spiritual nourishment. He says, no, Moses was only there three months, but he was nourished in his Father's house. His Father had something to give him. And it was the nourishment that this child required. Our Father, our Heavenly Father, has all we need in glory. Christ has gone ahead now even to prepare this place for us. But here on earth, before we get there, we as fathers, on this side and as men for have a job and responsibility to do to nourish, to have an inheritance, to impart something to those who are in the Father's house and not make them feel like strangers. Jesus says, look at what he does here. He's sending this message as a word of comfort. Let not your heart be troubled. Right? He says in chapter 14, verse number 1, when he talks to the people here, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. Right? Because Jesus says that before, he just got through telling Peter that you were going to deny him, that he was going to deny me. And he says, will you lay down your life with me for my sake? He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, in chapter 13, verse 38, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now this is Peter, the outspoken, you know, one of the, the leaders in the group here. And if, man, this, he, he's what? He's going to do what? But Jesus says, look, let not your heart be troubled. Don't worry about that. For in my Father's house, or many men say, if you believe in God, believe also in me. If you believe in God the Father, Jesus says, it requires that you believe in me as well because I am his son. The, 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 the key that you and I have, the access we have to the Father's house comes through the Son, Christ Jesus, who's gone away to prepare this place for us. We can't get to God, you all, and skip over Jesus. I, I can't just skip my way into the Father's house without going through the Son. You can't come into our home, or the home where we live, without coming through the door. If you come in any other way, you're a robber, you're a thief, you're, you're a ne'er-do-well. You're not welcome. Don't come climb through a window. Don't come through this. Don't come through that. If you're going to come, come ring the doorbell. Come knock on the door and let us open the door and let you in. But Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Why? For in my Father's house are many mansions, or many dwelling places. And he says, if it were not so, I would have told you there's truth in the Father's house. Jesus said, if it wasn't so, I would have told you. Jesus said, I'm not lying 
to you. There shouldn't be any treachery as the Egyptians dealt with the children of Israel. Shouldn't be any treacherous dealings with those of us who are in the Father's house. Shouldn't be any trickery and trying to trying to do some smoke and mirrors and trip folks up. But Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you. There should be truth there. Right? The nourishment that we talk about, Moses receiving nourishment in his father's house. What we give and what we feed our children and those who come to the father's house ought to be those things of truth. It shouldn't be hearsay and speculation. And what's the, the hot thing or the end thing this month or today? It shouldn't be that. It should be the truth contained in the word of God. Jesus said, look, if it wasn't so, I would not do it. But he says, now I go and prepare a place for you. And he says, and I will come and eat and receive him to myself. See, it does us no good to make all these preparations and then have no one to come in there and take part. God has a house, right, set up for tonight. Christ goes to make preparation, and then he comes to receive us and bring us in. It would have been kind of sad for us. We've been looking forward to my in-laws coming last week. It would have been kind of unfortunate if all of a sudden something changed they couldn't come. We know things come up. But we had made preparation. You know, I'd, I'd taken off some time from work and to make myself available to them and to be around this and another. It would have been unfortunate to do all these preparations. And it was like, oh, wait a minute. But we were expecting them. We were expecting them with glad hearts, right? We weren't regretting their visit. We were looking forward to their visit, to come and spend time with their family here in Georgia and then to attend the graduation of our son, to show their love and support, right? Because they were there when this young man was born. They remember holding him before he could hold himself. And all these wonderful things. Now they get to see this young man with his cap and gown on walking across the stage. Matter of fact, salutatory and giving a speech at the graduation to his class and all those who were in earshot there at the George Dome. And they probably go back in their mind, much like we as parents remember, wow. You know, this child that we helped to nourish and to grow up, and when he needed this, we tried to make sure he had what he needed to get him to this particular point. There was a certain amount of, of pride and a sense of accomplishment. It's praying, not that our job is done, no. We don't see that our job is done, but we're glad, and we can say that, man, this is a product. This is something that came through the house God blessed us to have. Whether it was the house we started at in Texas, or where God has blessed us to be here in Georgia. But prayerfully, that foundation not only be for this child, but for the other three children in our home as well. But if I am, quote, unquote, I don't know, wise or whatever enough to try to do that for my family, look at what God is. Imagine God in his house and all that he has for you and I. So much so that Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare. I'm getting it ready for you. Whatever needs to be made ready in my father's house, Jesus says, I'm going to have it ready for you. When we look again at our place and position in the father's house, we talk about inheritance being there, truth being in the house of the Father, the nourishment that you and I would need to live productive and fruitful Christian lives being in the Father's house and in His care. And remember now, we have access to it. Our key is through Christ Jesus. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture to you now. I'm going to turn to Isaiah and I'm going to read a portion of Isaiah chapter 22. And we look at the key to the house of David here. Isaiah chapter 22. We'll begin at verse number 20. It says, And it came to pass in that day, or and it, and it shall come to pass, excuse me, in that day, that I shall call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. God is speaking now a judgment against Shebna. And Shebna, uh, here in verse number 15, is called a treasure. Shebna got a little full of himself, realizing that being in God's house, he got a little full of himself. And had folks build him a sepulcher, which is nothing but a tomb, a dying place, right? But had this built in his honor, and it says there, uh, he says, um, uh, verse 16, What hast thou here, and whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulcher here, as he that heweth him out a sepulcher on high? And that gave it, gave it a habitation for himself in a rock. He says, who are you to do this for you? You know, you're the treasure. You're supposed to be serving me. But God says, who are you to do this for you? And he goes against him and speaks a judgment and says, this is going to be taken away from you. And I'm going to raise up this person who will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the house of Judah, and the key, verse 22, to the house of David. Will I lay upon his shoulder so he shall open and none shall shut. 
and he shall shut, and none shall open. Now he's speaking about Eliakim here, but doesn't that sound also like Jesus? About the access and the key that God has given Jesus, right? Because Jesus said whatever he looked, whatever he told the disciples, whatever they would lose, on earth would be loose in heaven. But God gave Jesus Christ the authority to do some things here on earth. And those things that Christ set up, all those that God gave him, belong to him. Christ opened the door, you all, to that house, to that Father's house we talked about in 14 2. Christ is the key. Part of that Davidic line, he opened the door so that you and I have access. Because he goes on here in John 14. And round around verse number, I believe it's verse number 6, when he talks about being the way, the truth, and the life. He's the access. He's the key. Now here we show a picture of Christ Jesus, and you can see it in Isaiah. It says, he shall, it says, number one, the key of the house of David shall lay upon his shoulder. Sounds almost like that government being among his shoulders. Isaiah talked to us about about Jesus. So he shall open, none shall shut. He shall shut, none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. A wonderful statement there. And it said, and I will fasten him as a nail or a peg in a sure place. I want to be fastened in a sure place in the house of God. I want him to do that for me, to, 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 to fasten. You know, you think about a nail. Think about a nail. You take a nail and you put it into something, it takes pressure down. If that nail can speak, you think it will be appreciated being bopped on this because it's called the head. The head of the nail will be stuck into that plank or whatever you're doing. But it's fastened there for a reason, for a purpose. I want to be fastened. You and I should be fastened into the house of God, into the Father's house for a reason. And we there again, we showed our access and that key, just like you told Elijah, our key is Jesus Christ, who's the way, the truth, and the life. But Jesus gives a simple message this morning. In my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, he says, I would have told you. Jesus says, for you and I today, church, as we look at the world today, and the times and the climate in which we live in, we have a house, a dwelling place to go to that God has formed in ages past, and now our Savior Jesus Christ has gone ahead of us and is preparing that place for you and I. And in that house, and in that arm of safety that God has for us, there's truth, there's nourishment, there's all the things you and I need to grow and to thrive. And it begins here, the picture of that is here where we have on this side, the house of God, the church. We're called the temple of God, right? Our bodies are the temple of God. And we make up the church, right? God's, if you will, the house of God here on this earth that Christ set up. And he said, the gates of hell shall not, what? Prevail against it. They'll beat up against it. But they're not going to prevail. They're not going to breach and break through and destroy what God has set up. But Jesus says, in my Father's house, we have hope in the Father's house. You and I can look forward to the hope. There are blessings for us there. There's peace in the Father's house. All that you and I need, but we got to get there. And the way we get there is through Christ Jesus. And as the song we sang right before the message, what the world needs to hear, the world needs to hear that message about a Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the way who is the truth, who is the light, who can give them access. They may not have a home on this earth. Some people live in an apartment. Some people don't even have that. Some people live in the woods over here off of uh, Flint River, up off Jonesburg. You know, don't have a home. Some people are under the bridges there in Atlanta, down on, off Central and Memorial Drive. They don't have a home. But guess what? They can have a home in Jesus. Because what we have here is fleeting anyway. But they can have a home because Jesus is in my Father's house. There's plenty of room for me as well as for you. So what we want to do and what the world needs to hear is that message about the house that God has for you and I and the place that Christ is setting up for you, for you, for you, you, you and me. And that's what he has for us. And Jesus offers this as words of comfort here now. Because he says, let not your heart be troubled. We need to tell the world, don't worry about what you see today. What's going to happen in November? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next Friday? It's not about it. Let not your heart be troubled. Right? We understand that we will have trouble, but our heart shouldn't be troubled. Not those of us who are disciples of Christ. Our heart shouldn't be troubled with the cares and burden down the cares of this world. Why? Because we have a home on high. Our Father's house. Right? Because Jesus is in my Father. Well, God is also what? He's my Father. Because I accepted His Son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. So God is my Father. Well, so I can say in my Father's house, there are many mansions, many dwelling places. And Christ is going ahead now to create are to prepare a place for me. This morning now, our next
next election. To God be the glory. Psalm number 29. Verse number 2 says what? Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Amen. To God be the glory. 